Hello, gentle listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Hex Radio, brought to you by your own favorite Hex Maniac, Echo. Today's broadcast is a bit of a different one. You could also say in many ways that it's a special sort of broadcast. You see, well, you'll see later on, of course. Well, seeing isn't the right word. Listening is, of course, what I'm talking about. But, to begin tonight's topic, I'll be talking about a very specific type of fairy. A cat she, to be exact. You see, when dealing with the fae, you come across a lot of interesting characters. And when you're a witch, it's only natural that you would interact with cats. The cat she is a very special kind of fairy, due to the fact that some believe that it's anything from a fairy to a goblin to an actual witch in disguise. There is some folklore that believes that a witch can turn into a cat nine times, but on that ninth time, they're forced to remain a cat for the rest of their lives. Of course, I can't say that this is fact, as I myself am not able to turn into a cat, but in the past, who knows what witches were capable of? It seems as if, over the years, we've lost a great deal of power. Celtic folklore is something that I am particularly fond of, so when it comes to Irish and Scottish fairies, I have to admit there is a fondness there, an interest. Of course, Gaelic mythology has always been far from my strong suit. The words are often difficult to pronounce and a little bit complicated. It's hard to admit, but in school I was much more interested in Greek mythology than anything to do with my own ancestors. Then, later on, I grew interested in Egyptian mythology, which in and of itself is convoluted. And so, I hate to admit, I haven't really studied my family's past as much as I should. Perhaps one of my own ancestors was able to shapeshift into a cat. (laughs) It's entirely likely that... There are cats out there related to me, then. The cat she was believed to be able to do a lot of different things, one of which was the ability to steal souls. There is a reason why, in the past, they would perform wakes over bodies. It was to watch them before they were in the ground, to keep a cat she from coming in and stealing the person's soul before it could be claimed. People would try their best to cause distractions to keep the cat busy and away from the corpse before burial. There would be games of leaping and wrestling. There would be music playing and riddles being told and, of course, no cat distraction is complete without catnip. Very specifically, it was said that they had to keep fires well away from the body, for as anyone who owns a cat knows, they are highly drawn to warm places. If a fire was anywhere near the body, they would surely ignore all of the distractions and make themselves perfectly at home there. Perhaps next week I'll talk about a different kind of Celtic fairy, but for now, I believe it's time for the special part 
of this broadcast. You see, I went to the local library, and I got a book of stories that have occurred in my own home. So, with that said, let's begin. The name of this book is Outer Banks Mysteries and Seaside Stories. It's written by Charles Harry Wedby, if anyone is interested in picking it up and reading it themselves. Forward. What happens twice will happen three times. This is a saying that has been prevalent on the outer banks of North Carolina for many generations. Many people believe it and can cite you example after convincing example of its truth. Certainly it is true in the case of this little volume, the third in a series dealing with the folk tales and legends of that fabulous region which played such an important part in the beginnings of our country. The other two books have received kind reception and generous acceptance. It is hoped that this effort will likewise be pleasing to the folklore buffs, as well as to the folks who just love a good tale. Not all these tales are set on or by the sea. Some of them are said to have taken place on the broad sounds and rivers that were the highways of early settlers. All of them have the salty scent of coastal Carolina, and they are genuine parts of our history as a colony, and then as a state. All are true to the times and places in which they are said to have occurred. Charles Harry Wedby, Whalebone Junction, Nags Head, North Carolina. The Indian Gallows. The American Live Oak, one of the most beautiful evergreens, is entwined in the history and legend of the Carolina coastland. Sturdy and majestic, it is said to grow 100 years, live 100 years, and die 100 years. Be that as it may, there are many ancient specimens still beautifying the landscape, and one of them, located in the deep woods of Collington Island, just west of the Wright Brothers Monument, is a locale of one of the most persistent and touching legends of the storied region. The tree is called the Indian Gallows Tree, and it was one of two live oaks growing within ten feet of each other. In time, a large limb from one of the trees grew out in the direction of the other tree, and the tip of that limb actually pierced and grew into the trunk of its neighbor, until the entire joinder developed into a huge letter until the entire joinder developed into a huge letter H with the crossbar or cross limb, being a good ten feet off the ground. This cross limb put out shoots from the top, giving the whole thing the appearance of a garlanded archway, with the top of the arch being almost perfectly level and parallel with the surface of the ground beneath. Thus the trees grew long before our land was formed into a nation, and thus they continued until the early years of the present century, when one of the majestic trees died and was cut and carved into small souvenirs by the people who visited the place and were fascinated by the story connected with it. According to our legend, in 1711, the family of Robert Austin was cast ashore in a shipwreck on the outer banks of what was to become North Carolina. Luckier than most, the Austins were able to salvage many of their worldly goods with the help of a friendly hunting party of Tuscarora Indians, their lives and their property safe. The survivors began looking for a place to settle and began the process of carving their homestead out of the lush wilderness. Here again, the Indians were a great deal of assistance, transporting the new settlers in their canoes and pointing out likely locations. Foremost among these new-found friends was the handsome son of the chief of the tribe, a young brave called Prince Roanoke. One of the chief attractions of the English family, 
at least in the eyes of Roanoke, was the Austin's beautiful daughter, Elnora, a typical English beauty with deep blue eyes, a peaches and cream complexion, and a wealth of long, silky blonde hair. Elnora liked the young Indian prince and valued him as a true friend in this wilderness, but that was as far as it went with her. She was betrothed to one Henry Redwine, who had promised to follow her to the New World and make her his wife, just as soon as he had worked out his apprenticeship to a silversmith and was free to leave England. Finally, a suitable place for the Austins' home was found on the north end of Roanoke Island, and here they began clearing a small patch of ground, setting out net stakes in the nearby sound, and generally making ready to work a living out of the land and sea. The weather was mild, and the Indians continued to be friendly, so things began to look bright and hopeful for the little family of settlers in that good year 1711. Prince Roanoke visited the area often, and he and the young and beautiful Elnora took long walks together, communicating as best they could and dreaming the dreams of youth everywhere. Roanoke could not conceal his love for the English maid, and told her of it on one lovely moonlit night as they strolled on the peaceful, wave-lapped shore of the island. She heard him out, and, misty-eyed with empathy and understanding, she told him that her heart belonged to her English lover, and that she must remain true to her vow. She was bound by her heart, as well as her vow, to await his coming to the new world and the establishment of their home. Heartbroken and ashamed, Roanoke returned to his home up the mighty river. Hope is the last thing that dies in man, however, and in the months that followed he returned occasionally to visit with his kin on the island, and to talk and walk again with his beloved Elnora. If things were hopeful and bright in the Austin household, they were anything but peaceful in the heart and mind and in the dreams of old King Kashi, monarch of all the Tuscarora tribes, and the father of the young Prince Roanoke. King Kashi hated the intruding whites with all his savage heart. I have to break here. I was going to save this for the end of this story, but... I must say, kings and princes, really. <sighs> Savage, really. Just as much of me is Native American as is of Irish descent, so I shall press on and endeavor to finish this. But let me just say, I highly disagree with this. King Kashi hated the intruding whites with all his savage heart, and he never ceased to dream of the day when they would be driven from his once happy and uncongested hunting and fishing grounds. History now records that it was in the year 1712 that he secretly began to form his Tuscarora Confederacy adjoining together of the various Tuscarora families with the Cori Indians and the Machapunga Indians to the south and east in a common bond of mistrust of the new settlers and resentment of their presence. Finally, in 1713, a plan for the massacre of all the whites began to take shape. There were many councils held deep in the wood, where the various chiefs discussed strategy and the chances for winning such a war of extermination. Prince Roanoke knew about these meetings, of course. He even attended some of them. He was familiar with his father's hatred of the white men, but he never really believed anything drastic would result from all these meetings and rantings. He avoided such gatherings when he could find a good excuse. So it befell that the young prince was as much surprised as anyone when he learned that the Tuscarora Confederacy had evolved into a Tuscarora Council of War. A definite plan had been made, and dates had actually been set for a concerted attack on all white settlements and outlying farms in the region. An intricate time schedule had been adopted to coordinate the various attacks. 
All was to be done by stealth, of course, and every effort was to be made to take the whites by surprise, and thus make their annihilation easier. No one, man, woman, or child, was to be spared. The war was to be treated as a holy war, and all must die. Immediately, Roanoke's thoughts turned to his beloved Elnora, and the certainty of her fate when the raiding band assigned her island should arrive at her small cabin. King Kashi had planned that his son and heir apparent should take a leading part in the execution of these massacres, but the young brave had quite different intentions. Slipping quietly away at midnight from his father's village up the mighty Chowan River, the young prince crept silently to where he had hidden his small, fast canoe. He shoved it off from shore, sprang in, and moved out onto the broad bosom of the river. Heading downstream as rapidly as his paddle could drive him, he hurried toward the island to where his beloved slept, quite unmindful of her grave danger. On and on glided the small boat, with Roanoke trying to conserve his strength, and yet gain as much distance as possible before the growing light of dawn forced him to hide on shore. There he rested and slept, into the falling darkness sent him once again on his errand of mercy. Arriving at long last at the island, where he had left his beloved, he was startled and dismayed to see tall flames leaping skyward from the direction of the Austin homestead. Hiding his canoe in the tall marsh grass at the north end of the island, the young prince crept stealthily through the woods until he came near the clearing he knew so well. The scene that he had feared to find lay before his eyes. The Austin home and all the outbuildings were aflame, and there in the farmyard, gun in hand, lay the lifeless body of Robert Austin, the shaft of an arrow protruding from between his shoulder blades. A few feet away lay the body of Mrs. Austin, one arm extended toward her husband as if in a final effort to help him before the crushing, mangling blow of the tomahawk had ended her dream of the good life in this new world. Neither body had been scalped. The Indians had not yet learned this grisly trick from renegade white men. Elnora was not to be seen anywhere, nor were any of the raiding party in evidence. Unwilling to venture into the clearing from the comparative safety of the forest, Roanoke lay perfectly motionless and silent until the fires burned themselves out and darkness once again enveloped the scene. Still, there was no trace of Elnora or of the raiding Indians. One last chance remained. A little to the south of the northernmost tip of the island, there was a hidden cave right at the water's edge where storm tides had carved out a large hole under the overhanging bank. Roanoke and Elnora had walked there many times during their visits together, and, as far as he knew, only the two of them were aware of the cave's existence. With a downcast heart and faint hope, the young brave threaded his way through the underbrush until he came to the hidden mouth of the cave. It was pitch black inside and completely silent, but he dared not make a light. With a sigh of despair, he was turning away from the hiding place when he heard a sob, a very human sob from that dark hole. Rushing to the very end of the cave, he found his Elnora safe and sound, but almost hysterical with grief and fear. Clasping her tightly in his arms, he rocked slowly back and forth and made little comforting noises until she became calmer. Finally, she was able to sob out the account of how she had been at the edge of the clearing when she saw the raiding party of painted Indians descend on her homestead, kill her mother and father, and set fire to the buildings. In their frenzy and war-lust, the Indians had not even seen Elnora in the darkness, and she had run blindly, not even knowing the way she ran, until she found herself at the cave. There she had hidden in mortal terror until the young prince had arrived. 
Now the young couple was faced with the even greater danger of trying to avoid the raiding Indian war parties who were ravaging the isolated white settlements of the Albemarle. Their only hope lay in reaching Edenton, far up the broad reaches of the Albemarle Sound and the Chowan River. They now knew that capture would mean their torture and death by the traditional Indian method, being burned alive while strapped to a sturdy post or stake. Daylight travel was out of the question. Their sole chance lay in traveling at night and hiding by day. This is exactly what they did. Their first night of travel was made more secure, if much more difficult, by the arising of a great storm. Strong winds and driving rain hid them from spying eyes, but also nearly swamped the little canoe and made it much more difficult to handle. Fortunately, they had a following wind that drove the small craft before it like a chip on the ocean, sometimes almost driving under the waves, but at other times causing it to plane over the following sea. All that stormy night, the young Roanoke paddled and steered his canoe toward the Chowan, while El Nora tried desperately to bail the boat with her cupped hands. It was a wild night. As the cold gray first light of approaching dawn spread across the eastern sky behind them, they beached their boat on a sand spit that projected from the shore. They disembarked and dragged the canoe up into the shelter of a dense pine forest. Roanoke then went back and, with a branch broken from a pine tree, carefully walked backward as he wiped from the sand the keel mark of the little boat and the footprints of the travelers. When he returned to the hiding place in the trees, even the most careful searcher would have been unable to tell that anyone or anything had passed that way. Completely spent, the two young fugitives lay down on the forest floor and, cushioned by a centuries-old carpet of pine needles, dropped quickly into the deep sleep of exhaustion. Food was not a problem. They would have been too bone-weary to eat, even if they had had food. During the morning, the wind subsided into a gentle, southerly breeze, and the rain continued to fall steadily, hissing through the needles of the pine trees and dropping softly to the ground. At sunset, Roanoke awoke, and while El Nora slept, he carefully scouted the area. He found nothing to increase his apprehension, but he did discover some berries and some edible pine tree buds, which he carefully gathered just as long as he could see in the fading light. Returning to the canoe, he found Elnora awake and anxious to continue their journey. After eating their meager meal, the two climbed back into the canoe and resumed their flight toward what they hoped would be safety. It was an hour before daybreak when the headland of Edenton loomed before them. They reached the town wharf just as the town folk and fishermen were beginning to come out of their houses to begin another day's work. Excitement and indignation buzzed the little town as the story of the massacre and the flight of the survivors spread like wildfire. Well did they know, these pioneers in this lush wilderness, that vengeful old King Kashi would not delay long in trying to apprehend any fugitives from his raids and to wipe out the settlement on the banks of the Chowan. Attack, they knew, was imminent. Riding at anchor in the wide harbor of Edenton, there lay a fat merchant ship that had arrived only hours before with a cargo of, among other things, powder and shot and several dozen muskets. It may well have been the passage of that very ship up the waters of the Sound which so frightened the raiding Indians that they did not try to pursue Roanoke and El Nora in their frail canoes, if indeed they had any knowledge of the couple's desperate flight. Wonder of wonders, at least for El Nora, not only did the ship contain supplies and weapons, but it also held the person of her beloved Henry Redwine, free from his apprenticeship and come to claim his bride and his future in the new world. For Henry and Elnora, happiness was complete. Their sorrow at the death of her parents was softened by the joy of their reunion. Not so, however, for Roanoke. He now saw his last chance of winning the beautiful English girl fade away to nothing. He was also faced with what he knew would be the anger and malice of his own father, King Kashi. 
He was, indeed, a man without a family, without a hope for the future. In Edenton, history tells us, preparations for defense went forward rapidly. Log walls were erected just outside the town, and readouts of earth were thrown up to give shelter to the defenders. There were those in the community who looked askance at the presence of the young Prince Roanoke in their midst as all this was going on, but he worked so willingly along with the settlers in the preparation of the defenses, even scouting the nearby forest daily for signs of approaching Indians, that the people began to accept him as their true ally. One by one, the murmurings against him ceased. When the attack finally did come, it was fierce but short-lived. The settlers were too well organized, and their musket fire from behind both log and earthen walls was too devastating for the Indians to bear. They fell back, carrying their dead and wounded with them. What finally broke the spirits of the attackers was a well-placed cannonball from one of the deck guns from the armed merchant ship. The ball landed right in the midst of a group of Indians, killing several and breaking the leg of King Kashi himself. They fell back in disarray, and never again seriously threatened Edenton, which continued to be too well-armed and disciplined for the forces the Indians could muster thereafter. Although raids on isolated farms continued, the uprising of the Tuscarora Confederacy had just about run its course. There, now, began for the young Prince Roanoke a most frustrating and sorrowful time. He could not safely return to his own people, and yet he felt very much an outcast in the town of Edenton. Forgetting how well he had served them in the recent armed conflict, many of the whites distrusted him just because he was an Indian. Elnora and her new husband were consistently kind and thoughtful toward the young brave, and did their best to relieve his loneliness, but to little avail. Their very kindness served to deepen the pain of seeing his beloved happily married to another man. Finally, Roanoke decided to take the fateful step that would either solve many of his problems, or else end them once and for all. He would return, an 18th century prodigal son, to his father's tribe. He labored under no illusions about the cruelty of Indian justice. He knew his father's temperament, but, after all, he was the only son of the old chief, and he believed that, in his own savage way, the old man loved him. Days and weeks went by as the young prince prepared himself for his journey of homecoming. He searched the woods with persistence until he found just the perfect specimen of turkey cock to yield the golden bronze feathers for his girdle and a splendid white heron to furnish the head decoration to which he was entitled by tribal law in recognition of his accomplishments as a youth. Prime quality doe skin for his cape and tanned otter furs for his loincloth were available from local trappers and hunters. Finally, his ceremonial costume was complete and perfect according to Indian tribal protocol. Roanoke looked every inch the chief as he stood on the wooded edge of Oakham Street in Eddington and bade goodbye to his white friends. Tears filled the eyes of the young brave and the newlyweds as they shook hands with friendly palms cupped on each other's shoulders. Finally, with a tremendous heave of his young shoulders, Roanoke turned away from his friends, walked to where his frail canoe floated, and paddled off eastward over the broad bosom of Albemarle Sound. It seems almost certain that the young prince was shadowed from the very start and for almost the entire journey down the sound. At any rate, when he finally reached his father's village, a committee of young braves was waiting for him. He was roughly seized, carried into the Indian village, and forthwith tied to a man-high stake set deeply into the sand. There he remained, without food or drink, until nightfall, when the neighboring chiefs began to arrive to convene the court that would decide his fate. Throughout all that night, and during the entire night-long trial that followed, Prince Roanoke never uttered a word. 
He did not seek to defend himself or to offer excuses or reasons as sub-chief after sub-chief made long, emotional speeches accusing him of traitorous conduct, of being responsible for the failure of their holy war, and of being entirely false and untrue to his father, his tribe, and the Tuscarora Confederacy. One after another, they all demanded that he be put to death for his sins against his people. Some of the orators even went so far as to spit in his face and strike him with their ceremonial gourds. King Kashi uttered not one word in defense of his son. Finally, the vote was taken, just as the day began to break over the forest. The decision of the chiefs was unanimous. Death to the traitor. Because of the young brave's royal heritage, the chiefs decided to allow the old king to decide the manner of his son's execution. Rising to his feet, with all the glory of the rising sun spreading its light behind him, the ancient and crippled king denounced Prince Roanoke, and with no show of sorrow whatsoever, disclaimed him as a son. He has loved the white man well, intoned the old chief, and he has reaped the reward of the white man's fickleness. Let him, therefore, not be granted the ancient Indian execution of fire at the stake, but rather the shameful death on the gallows by which the white thieves kill their own criminals. His voice rising to almost an hysterical scream, the vengeful old Kashi spat out, Let the traitor be hanged by the neck until he's dead, dead, dead. With savage shouts of approval, the Indian braves seized the young prince again. They tore away the deerskin thongs, binding him to the ceremonial post, and threw them into the sand. With eager haste, they dragged him through the forest by the hair of his head, through brambles and thorns and across little creeks, until they reached the giant oaks with the peculiar cross branch between their trunks. Hastily fashioning a noose of rope, they placed it around Roanoke's neck and threw the other end over the cross branch. They hoisted the bound Roanoke, kicking into the air, and hung him by the neck, until he was indeed dead, dead, dead. Thus ends the legend of the Indian gallows tree. As early as the year 1846, Colonel William H. Rhodes of Birdie County published a poem entitled The Indian Gallows, which concludes with the Indian trial as Old Cashy exclaims, No, not the stake. He loves the pale face. Brothers, let him die the white man's death. Come, let us bend a tree and swing the traitor as the red men see. The pale-faced villain hang, give not the stake. To him who would the red man's freedom take, who from our fathers and our God would roam, and strives to rob us of our lands and home. They seize him now and drag him to the spot, where death await and pangs are all forgot. There are those familiar with the area who say that the legend is not ended yet. They say that sometimes, when the moon is full and the wind is still, you will hear the sound of mourning and keening and weeping, and the little creek that runs by the gallows will run red as blood. So, gentle listeners, let us first discuss the fact that, yes, there are a lot of problems with that story. However, let me check. Yes, yes, this was published in 1978, and as much as I hate to admit it, we cannot exactly hold the past accountable for what we now know to be different, as much as I would love to. Moving forward from that, and keeping in mind that I'm likely to run into more blatant racism, barely disguised by romanticizing, it's onward to the spell of the night. Now, due to how long this has been, the spell of the night is not actually a spell. Now, given that I initially began this episode with a discussion of Cat She, 
I would like to advise that if you own cats, take some catnip. Sprinkle it by the windows in a place where they love to nap and just let them enjoy themselves. Well then, we will be reconvening next week where I think I will speak about another Celtic fae, read a another story from this book, and tell you another spell. Thank you for listening, my dear, sweet, gentle listeners. Happy hauntings. <laughs>